when they had the euro, bond, the bond market was much more confident. So the Italians and the Greeks and their, you know, were able to borrow a lot more money uh, than they could have in the past. And that's exactly what we did. And now uh, they're paying the price for all that debt. But we've got a similar situation. We've got even more debt. We're going to have to pay the same price. It's just a question of time. Now, Peter, continuing, going back to MF Global, uh, I've seen numbers in the news of he was betting 40 to 1. I've seen numbers in Bloomberg of 100 to 1. Regardless, then I saw the media going back two weeks ago or more spin it that, okay, they took Gerald Salente's six-plus figures and now 50,000 other people's money, and they're going to keep some people's segregated accounts 100%. And then others, they're going to you know, give them 60% back, but none of that's really started to happen. And now people are asking, where's the money? First, they said J.P. Morgan had it. Uh, and, and, and you know, as you pointed out, we actually have found the video clip of going back three years ago, right after Obama got elected, uh, they sent uh, the, the Vice President Biden over to New Jersey, and he's sitting there at the podium with Corzine saying, thank God when we were talking about having to have bank closures and, and uh, you know, uh, revaluations, you know, uh, uh, thank God that, uh, you know, bank holiday was the word. Thank God you were there advising us on our current plan. So when you say he's the top advisor and then he's a guy at the roulette wheel, not even betting on, you know, a bunch of spots, all the money, but what one number. I mean, it, 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 it's lunacy. It, it, it is scary. Yeah, well, what, what was his plan? How did he? How did Corzine run MF Global? It was lever up, bet big, even with other people's money, and just hope for the best. That's the Obama plan. That describes it right there. Borrow a bunch of money, other people's money, make a big leverage bet on government, on socialism, and hope. But, you know, we already know it doesn't work. You know, I, on my show today, which, you know, we do it at shiftradio.com is where I do the show, I went over the story of the pilgrims because a lot of people forget that America started as a socialist commune and we became capitalist once uh, the, the, the socialism produced famine and almost destroyed all the Yeah, settlers. more than half of them died in one year. Yeah, they, they died because it was from each according to his ability to each according to his need. It was everybody was in the 1% because there was no 99%. Everybody was equal. And so they were equally starving. And it wasn't until they abandoned socialism and embraced capitalism uh, that they actually started to prosper and they produced enough uh, food to actually have a Thanksgiving. So what Thanksgiving really celebrates is that the our ancestors, the, the first settlers, were smart enough to abandon socialism and embrace capitalism. What's crazy is that here we are hundreds of years later going in the opposite direction, trying to repeat the failed experiment that almost killed uh, the pilgrims. Well said. So, so first it was 600 million, then 700, then a billion, then 1.2, then 3 billion. Now they're saying it could be more than 3 billion of the 6.5 or whatever they went bankrupt with. Uh, I, I mean, you've got 130 plus employees. You've got a pretty big, you know, uh, firm yourself. You've been successful in investing. Looking at, you know, somebody who's obviously much bigger than you are and much in former head of Goldman Sachs. I mean, it does sound like they're insane to 40 to 1, 100 to 1, whatever it really was. 10 to 1's insane. Oh, yeah. So, well, so, they, so, so, what is the what is the mindset of these people? Or is there a plan to just go ahead? And, and was he making bad bets to somebody else in an inside deal to let them keep the money? Yeah. Well, again, they have a very different business model than me. See, I don't have any debt at all. So I don't gamble, you know, even with my own money, let alone somebody else's money or my client's money. So I just make fees. I charge commissions or fees for my services. So there's no there's there's no risk there to my solvency. But what what MF Global was doing was proprietary trading, borrowing up a lot of money that they can get cheap from the Federal Reserve and just gamble with it. You know, and if, if the gambles pay off, I mean, Corzine probably would have made millions, maybe billions. Who knows? Uh, but it did. But, you know, it, it, it didn't work. And so, uh, you know, who gets a lot of, you know, caught holding the bag? If you didn't have this perception of uh, too big to fail, if you didn't have the Fed out there backstopping everybody, keeping interest rates so low, guys like Corzine, they wouldn't be able to make money this way. They would be forced to make money the old fashioned way. They'd have to earn it. Going back, uh, Reuters even last week said this is sending shockwaves through commodities, corn, pork bellies, beef, that soybeans, farmers don't trust the system now because a lot of them uh, had their money taken. Uh, as it reaches into the billions, uh, from my research, this is one of the first times in modern history since the old you know, bucket shops 
that they're just saying we're not going to say where the money is. And now it turns out the head of the CFTC had to recuse himself. He reportedly is invested with Corzine in this. The insiders, it turns out, got warnings a month ago, got their money out. Does this herald a really dangerous precedent if Corzine is allowed to take people's private bank accounts, private brokerage accounts? Well, yeah, definitely. And I, you know, I don't think that this is a bearish uh, development for commodity prices. In the short run, maybe it's added to some of the pressure on commodity prices, which have pulled back quite a bit in recent months, along with stock market and other assets, plus the dollar has gained strength. But ultimately, if farmers really lose confidence in the futures market, that's kind of bullish for commodities because farmers use the futures markets to hedge their risk. And if they if they can't do that, if it's more difficult for farmers to hedge their risk, then that's, that's going to actually put more upward pressure on crop prices because farmers will plant less. If they can't hedge the risk, then they have to take less risk, which reduces the supply of these commodities and therefore increases their price. There you are. That's why in Venezuela or in communist Russia or China, they could never, they had 60 million starved to death under Mao in just a few years because no one could trust anybody. And we get back to this system where, why should I hire people? Why should I plant crops? If, if somebody's just gonna steal it anyways, and then that's how you go from the most prosperous nation to the most degenerate. <laughs> Well, that's what happened with the pilgrims. You know, why should I farm? I'm not going to get to eat any more than the guy that doesn't farm at all. I mean, that was the problem. You've got to have individual incentives. I mean, everybody is out there on this Occupy Wall Street. They want to criticize the big gap, the wealth disparity between the rich and the poor. Well, you want there to be a disparity. You want people to want to be rich. You know, that, that's what drives them and motivates them to create all these products that we all enjoy to, to run these businesses. It's because they want to be rich, right? So there's got to be a benefit to be rich rich. We can't all be the same. And the irony of it is some of the people who benefit the most in this system now are not benefiting from capitalism, but they're benefiting from what you talked about, the crony capitalism, the government and the bankers getting together to rob the poor and the middle class. That's what they should be protesting, not the capitalist the system itself. That's the only chance the poor and the middle class have. If they want to get rich, it's not going to be through government. I mean, maybe, yeah, if you get lucky and you're politically connected well, enough. Well, stay there, stay there. Let's talk about that more and whatever issues you want to raise on the other side with Peter Schiff. But look at history, folks. Communism, collectivism is a nightmare. Free market's the way to go. Okay, we're back live and we're going to be taking your phone calls uh, here in the next segment. Uh, Henry listening on XM 166 and others and a bunch of news. Stay with us. Gerald Salente coming up in the last 30 minutes to give us an update since last week on the MF Global Peter, in the five minutes we've got uh, left, looking at Europe, looking at the crises that's happening, looking at uh, the decisions that are being made, where do you see all this going? What, what's most important on your radar screen right now? Well, you know, I think it's coming back here. You know, look at the weak bond auction that we had in the bond market last week, and everybody focused in on how weak that was. Well, you know, I think the reason that people didn't want want to buy 10-year bonds was because the yields were only 2% or just under 2%. People are starting to wake up at how ridiculous these low rates are. It wasn't that people were afraid that Germany or the ECB wasn't going to bail out uh, the rest of Europe. I think it's more likely that they're afraid they will bail them out and print money to do it, and they're recognizing that if they're going to create a lot of inflation, that these 2% 10-year yields are too low. We've got the same situation. Our 10-year bond yields are 2%. We're creating even more inflation. In fact, in America, there isn't even a, a choice here. There isn't even a chance that we do the right thing. They still might do the right thing over there in Europe. I mean, we're, there's no way we're doing the right thing. We've already said we're not cutting anything. We're just printing, 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 because we don't even think there's a problem there. So maybe we're not too far off from a failed bond auction here in the U.S. And that's going to send a much bigger shock weight around the world if that happens uh, than what happened in the bond market. Well, you're right. We've seen Greenspan, we've seen Bernanke all say, there's no problem, we'll just print money. And they know where that's going, but they've just committed to it. So how do you see things breaking down then? Well, I mean, eventually, the world is going to take them out their word. And printing money is a problem in and of itself. Once you tell your creditors that you're going to screw them, that you're just going to print money and pay them back with the monopoly money, then the game is over. 
The only reason that people around the world are buying dollars is because they don't believe that. They think we're good for the money. They think American taxpayers can actually pay enough in taxes uh, to legitimately pay off these debts. There's no, there's no chance of that at all. Uh, so you know, this is just a you know a blind moment of of, of confidence that it's, somehow it's going to end. Someone's going to say the emperor has no clothes, and the emperor is in it's in America. It's not it's not over there in Europe. So what are you investing in? What are you hot on right now? Where do you see gold going? And then give us your brief take on um, Ron Paul. I think gold's going up, but I think the strongest looking commodity right now is oil. I mean, I've just been watching the crude oil market uh, very closely recently, and it's been acting very, very strong, even in the face of weakening stock prices, a strengthening dollar relative to uh, other currencies. Oil has been very strong. We're just under $100 a barrel right now, so I think oil is going a lot higher. Um, as far as Ron Paul, I've always been bullish on Ron Paul. The question is, will enough other people get bullish on Ron Paul so that he can win? I mean, the, the latest uh, anti-Romney candidate is Newt Gingrich. I think if Gingrich f flames out, I can't see who's left but Ron Paul. So hopefully we can have Gingrich uh, uh, start to move down a little bit uh, between now and the Iowa caucus. And you know, who knows? I mean, if Ron Paul can win Iowa, it's not impossible. He might get a lot of media attention. And if he gets a lot of media attention you know he, he could do a lot better in new hampshire he's doing pretty good right now with basically hardly any media attention so imagine how we might do if the media actually started covering him which they would have to do if he won iowa and then we'll see a repeat on a national scale of rand paul when they finally covered him and started demonizing him and claiming that he was you know sacrificing children on mars mm -hmm. that's when his numbers went up even higher uh, so uh, clearly, if he can win some of those key states, they won't be able to ignore him. They'll go on the attack, and they're so discredited that that'll make him only go up. Yeah, you know, I, and I, you know, I don't really think there's much. They can try to dust off some of those old newsletters and try to say that he's racist again. But, you know, I don't think that's going to work. I mean, they've, they've, they've tried it before. I think it's, it's, it's a pretty a thin attempt to try to discredit somebody who really is a very honorable person and has a distinguished record uh, in the House and in his personal life. What else do you think we can do to make sure Ron Paul wins? Because he's certainly in uh, light years ahead of where he was four years ago in the last campaign. Yeah, well, you know, we can donate. I maxed out my personal contribution to Ron Paul, but people can make a donation to his campaign. You know, I tried. You can dial for him. They have a dialing where you can go to his website and sign up and call from home. It's very easy to take surveys and help out uh, the campaign to identify the Ron Paul supporters, to identify uh, people who are leaning in his direction uh, so they can help identify identify these voters, call them up, change their minds, get them out to the polls. So there's a lot of things on a grassroots level we can do uh, to help Ron Paul win. Of course, exactly. if you live in one of these states, if you live in Iowa or New Hampshire, make sure and go up and show up at the polls. And exactly. Vote. And, you know, get some lawn signs, tell your friends, you know, uh, spread the word. Peter Schiff, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this, th th this mind game that he can't win is really targeting Ron Paul supporters. So you just believe that and sit down when he's on the verge of being the front runner. Like Shark Teeth, all these other candidates have come forward. Uh, all that's left is Ron Paul. Peter Schiff, thank you so much. We'll be back Thanks, with Al. your calls. Thank you. Ton of news straight ahead. We're on the march.